Well, when I, but when I went in there, in the Zygon, I carried a $30,000 for the Newsweek payroll in cash. Strapped to my body or taped. And uh, that was against the law. Yeah, there was a uh, uh, coup, attempted coup, that happened uh, while I was in the air from Hong Kong. Uh, they, they couldn't get any money over there. They had no, uh, Lauren had no money to pay his people. So, uh, out of the Newsweek Bureau in Hong Kong, I got 30,000. You couldn't do it in hundreds, you know, you, 20s were all in currency that really mattered over there. Yeah, American 20s were set in gold, gold chains. And uh, I took it, I smuggled it in. And there was a big sign, right, it has a size of that wall over there in the airport saying, uh, it is illegal to possess over $100 U.S. and anybody uh, carry more than that should either confess now or if they catch you later, it's a, we'll go to immediately, immediately to prison. Put out by the South Vietnamese government. But that morning, there had been a coup and uh, the Air Force had dropped bombs on the palace. Yeah, let them dismiss the uh, continental garden. So I got off the, off the plane. Not half full. The people that I, I was interested in who they were going back in at that time. It was weird though, all kind of people, all kind of uh, party people. I remember, you know, some kids that were friends of Princess Diana and the royal family. People wanted to be there in Saigon for the last party. Correspondents who hadn't been there in years. I'm coming back in. You yeah. going to use all that stuff one day, Hunter? I mean, it sounds irresistible as you talk about it. Um, it does. Yeah. Recollection and Tranquility? Oh. That's a book right there, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I don't know if I'm... Why, as a writer, or did you think about that you were writing as a writer? Why did you go to Vietnam? Uh, the war has been so much a part of my life for so long. You know, more than 10 years, I've been beaten and gassed for it. You've been what? Beaten and gassed and, uh, you know, the society over here had, uh, pretty much gotten into which side are you on. And I was clearly, uh, <coughs> on the other side. <coughs> I just wanted to see it be a part of the, uh, the end of it. And to, to have did it make you a better writer? Mm. Well, not at the time, because I didn't have a chance to write that much. I was just really writing, uh, sort of pretending I was working. You mean you just kept notebooks and tapes without writing very much about what you saw and felt? Oh, no, I, I wrote all the time. Yeah. I, I missed what you, I didn't I, quite get the answer to, we, to Terry's question. I think it gets back to young kids. Gets to yeah, it, it does. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, it was interesting, the, uh, Fitzgerald and, uh, and Hemingway in their, in their correspondence, Fitzgerald is always talking about how he wished he'd gone through a war and speaks endlessly, writes endlessly. And Hemingway is always saying, well, he says two things. He says that, um, uh, well, he tries to, well, he tries to calm uh, Fitzgerald out on this, on this wish. Do you, you think it's part of a, a major part of a writer? Of a, a possible sphere that a writer can go through to go to a war? Well, this wasn't a war, really. Uh, it was over. And, yeah, people were being killed. A friend of mine, a photographer, was killed uh, on the last day of the war. Yeah, those combat photographers, it's a different breed, man. That's why I, those are crazy boys. And that's where I got most of my uh, help. Those, those were the the opium smokers and the... A good man would have caught that, but I didn't. Uh, it disappeared. Yeah. Oh, well. It came in this direction. The ass of the hash. Uh, I, 
never really had any fear over there. Except when, uh, what would you want to cover? You know, the last battle of the war. Fuck, you know, uh, hire a jeep. I always go out with, uh, you know, Caputo and Laura and some of the photographers. Yeah, it was nothing like ever in the war that Elberstam and Mel Brown and those guys covered. It was, uh, one of the last follies of the war. And, yeah, you could be killed. But it was still a hugely dramatic uh, event that you, in a way, oh, one of the best stories, all of, one ever. of the best stories ever. Yeah. I, I've never been on. I would not. I would not trade that story for. There we are. That's, that's what we were talking, asking about. Yeah, I'm not sure why, but uh, yeah, in a way, I felt like I was paying off a debt. A debt too. I'm not sure. You know, but to be so influ influenced by the war for so long. Having it so much a part of my life, so many decisions, and then not to know it, not to be in it. It's sort of a culminating factor. Right? Yeah, the, yeah. The closing, talk, the closing the circle. Well, see, I was, well, I was on my way to Saigon in 1971 when I stopped in San Francisco and we went to that big CERN conference, the editorial conference. Of what? Of Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone. And that's where I made the argument that Rolling Stone should get into politics. I just started working for him, writing for him. I, I guess I developed a sudden kind of influence. And uh, in San Francisco, I uh, went down to Big Sur, and this was a, like a summit meeting of all the Rolling Stone editors, and the photograph is really uh, kind of historic. I was making the argument that Rolling Stone should cover politics, and I made it pretty heatedly, but I think Jan was about the only person that even half agreed with me. You know, a lot of smart guys there thought it was insane. I remember I everybody who was an ambitious journalist thought they had to get to Vietnam because of their career. It was an important career station. Writers thought that too, people who were doing fiction. Bob Stone never thought it, talked about it. Yeah, it could have been the... Uh, Something like that. I wasn't thinking of it in terms of career. Well, because I, after the uh, editorial conference, I went on for about three days and I made these passionate pitches to the group. Uh, one of these, they call them retreats now, I guess. But it was a big strategy conference. Where's the magazine going? Where are we going to take it? And uh, at the end of that, I finally had to say, uh, well, fuck you then. I'll cover it. I'll do it. Or somebody else you know, maybe suggested that. Well, if you're so fucking smart, why don't you go to Washington? Did you go to Vietnam? Was it going to go to what? Was it, where, was, where was the political Where was the arrow pointed at? Was it Washington or Vietnam? Vietnam. I was, I was, uh, I was on my way to Vietnam. Yeah. yeah I'll do it. Then. I'll do it myself. Yeah, yeah. cover national politics. So instead of going to Saigon, I had to come back here and move rock, stock, and barrel to Washington. Lease a house for a year, take the dogs. Sandy was pregnant. And uh, the only guy who would volunteer to help was Tim Krause. You know, the lowest guy on the totem pole. Uh, with a Serious stutter, almost a debilitating stutter. The Jan mocked all the time. Jan was extremely cruel to uh, the Kraus, which made me take up for him all the more. And uh, <coughs> Kraus was the only guy in the room. He was, he'd never written anything longer than a 300 word rock and roll concert review. For only so, he was out of the Boston Bureau, just a kid. And, uh, I said, all right, Tim, you and me. And, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do with him, or campaign for that matter. I'm not sure it could be done. 
it's somebody else. Uh, yeah, so my mind is wandering here in all directions, but yeah, Tim Krause is one of the really nice flowers of, uh, of that time. Wrote a great book. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was going to sort of be my California story. I, I realized I couldn't do it. It was just too much. So I, this is after I told him one night in Milwaukee that I was sick. Too sick to. He was going to write the sidebar. And I was going to write the main story as usual. And one night in the suite, I said, Oh, right, Tim, well, I hate to tell you this, but you're going to have to write the main story this week. And I want to write the sidebar. And he panicked. And then uh, I told you on that. He called and berated me and Krauss. Krauss only stuttered when Jan bitched at him. By the end of the campaign, he barely stuttered at all. And I would tell him, man, we, we got to stop that. We can't, we can't, you know, it's not, uh, it's not constructive. <laughs> and you know, he started and I'd say, come on, God damn it, spit it out. And it's easy for you to say. Well, yeah, I was. I, I was. Uh, I was just treating him like a, uh, like he was malingering. And of course, I knew he wasn't. And I recognized the stutter as a problem. But boy, he got it down. And Jan beat on him until the end of the campaign. I guess maybe he still does. He wrote the Wisconsin story. Yeah, I just let me push him a little bit. No, oh, yeah, that was fun. In the Air Force, where I was, uh, yeah, my, that's where I discovered that you could work for a newspaper and not have to go to work. Well, I read that amazing document on the wall, uh, which you have over there, which is a, a um, document from the commanding officer who says you are not to write, and this time you were in the... What, what were you writing then? What was what was it that got, that got you into trouble when you were in the Air Corps? What sort of pieces? Were, well, those are your first journalistic enterprises, presumably. Well, since high school, yeah. I was a uh, I mean, oddly enough, in, in high school, in the uh, Athenian Literary Association. The editor uh, for that year was Porter Bibb. You know, I see his name all the time. He's a, a financier of sorts in New York. I saw a picture somewhere the other day. Yeah, I grew up with him. And uh, in the Air Force, I was taken in the it was essentially uh, to be a pilot for pilot training. And that's why uh, I was persuaded to join it. And then I wanted to get out of town and quit. Be a pilot? Oh, yeah, I, I joined as a, as a, a pilot. And yeah, I was on the waiting list for uh, pilot training. And uh, I thought I'd go there after uh, basic. But they said, well, it's not still a waiting list, so we're going to put you into uh, intelligence and electronics. My, my score is indicated. I wanted intelligence, and they uh, said, well, listen to them. So they sent me to a uh, advanced radio electronics school. But you kept writing pieces during, the, during this? No, no. But I had written uh, stuff in high, in high school, even younger. But I hadn't really thought about it as a uh, solution to my problem. Problem. Yeah, and... Uh, you know, solution to what problem? Well, I wasn't adjusting too well to... Uh, society at large, uh, 
I was in jail the night my high school class graduated. And you thought writing might be a solution to this? Well, not, not then. I didn't know what the hell the solution was. I'd be a pilot. <laughs> it might, like it might idea, be good. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I had a pretty good grounding in literature in during high school. And reading the Proud Highway, I got the impression that you always wanted to be a writer. Well, wanting to and having to are two different things. Yeah. Well, let me get to this in the Air Force. And then, and then I learned that it was the thing I did best. And that was the rock, my rock and my saw, being a writer. And in the Air Force, it got me out of trouble because, uh, you know, they, they put me into a uh, electronic school, very uh, intense, long, like eight month school. The bright guys. But I, I liked it, I enjoyed it. But I didn't uh, want to stay there. I wanted to go to pilot training and if they, and then I, if they wouldn't send me to the pilot school uh, now, I wanted, they breached their contract and I went, I, I said, I'll just get out. Fuck you. And he wouldn't uh, do that at first. So I got down to Florida and after my running school and went reported out to the some hangar in the deep security area where we were going to work. And I told him that I want to, uh, I'm afraid of electricity. I have to get out of this business. And they kept stalling. I went up there to the base education office one day and signed up for some classes in, in Florida State and got along well with a guy uh, and, and, and I can see him right now. Uh, got to like him and he was signing me up and I was asking about other literary kind of things. It was a relief to get away from that goddamn shop shop down there. He was only for a while, and he said, uh, you know, uh, do, you about, do you know anything about sports? And I said, yeah, I know a lot about sports. And he, I was going to take writing classes, and I told him I'd been you know, editor of a paper in high school, uh, just the kind of stuff you, they want to hear. I was, that's what I was thinking. I was looking at any, you know, day like, and the guy said, uh, shit, you might just, we might be in luck. That's how he's looking at it. And he made a call and uh, asked me a few quick questions. Like, uh, he said that, well, it turns out that the sports editor is a base newspaper. It's a command newspaper. The paper had uh, a circulation of like 20,000 on the base and the uh, you know, civilian every area. It was the base itself was uh, the size of a normal county. What base was it? Eglin Air Force Base. Did you jump at this assignment as a sports editor? Well, I, I couldn't quite believe it. Uh, he called up there and said, uh, "Eglin, Eglin, E G L I N." Yeah. It's oh, Eglin, yeah. It's an Air Force proving ground command where they test things. It's huge. It's about half the uh, Northwest Florida. That animal there. Not that, a quarter. It's the size of some small state. Yeah. And, uh, I just had a, I got the picture of the, the sports editor of the staff sergeant had been arrested in Pensacola over the weekend for public drunkenness again. He was a boozer. And he'd been, this was the third, his third time being busted for public drunkenness in Pensacola. So yeah, he, he was pissing on the side of the building after they got it. But it was his third offense. And so they wouldn't let him out. And uh, the base information office, which is a, not on top of the hill for nothing, it was a busy place. But 
they were they ran the newspapers. And I, I said, sure, yeah, I can board that editor. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. And they had no lower positions. That was a position I had to move into. That was open. Editor. So I started as an editor. And, uh, boy, what a joy. I mean, I had, I took advantage of it more and more. I, I, immediately, I immediately started a column. But I remembered from reading the little journal, journal, journal that uh, the sports editor always had a column on the left side of the front page, Earl Ruby. Non-do. Yeah, I had the career journal. I said, I had my mother send uh, down copies of it so I could learn the layout. And, uh, types of, of uh, print. I got very educated on it. But all I knew when I went in there was like eight concepts or words. You know, I, I knew uh, paper had to be distributed. <laughs> and I knew what an editor had to do. Because I worked with him on that. Uh, I was sort of the art director of the uh, FBM thing. The two of us put it together. And then, uh, I was a good candidate for it. You know, so, what was your work. first column about? Do you remember? Well, I'm still confused about the guy he peeing against those. the wall. The guy what? The guy that was peeing against the wall. Did you? Did, did you no, he was the sports editor that he replaced. That oh, that was the guy. He never, was, he, he never came back. He never came before. back. Oh, I got it. Okay, over. I got confused. That was the <laughs> guy. A lot of Daily News guys. Yeah. Yeah. Wall, so. Okay. Yeah, they, they were trying to get him out of jail desperately. Well, Using all the influence they could, they could, and they this was the third time, and they couldn't. I got, it. I got it. So, fuck, in 24 hours they got a new sports editor. And we're. Young, strong, educated, ambitious. Yeah, that. That was the first week I wrote uh, a column. About. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Oh, I wrote some wonderful columns, which. You covered uh, a lot of football games, right? You covered flu and fights, even. You covered. Uh, yeah, well, at first I. Line. I, I decided to take it national right away. Of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, my job was to cover, like, base yeah. athletics, and I did that pretty well. I understood that. But yeah. Why was the commandant, if that, or the major general, who was so upset with what you were writing and asked you not to write anymore? And I'm Colonel Evans, so that the commandant. Yeah. I guess How do you do football. that as a sports editor? Well. I did things that were against regulations constantly. Have you seen my uh, recommendation that I be uh, released? Yes, well I, well, I saw it. I saw the thing into the wall. Did did you denounce Arthur Godfrey or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. This was in a column? In a sports yeah. column? In a sports column, you denounced Arthur Godfrey. Oh, uh, said he should be. He's he, a bad bowler. He'd just been busted for shooting animals in the air in Alaska. And he was coming down to be the MC at a, a, a firepower demonstration, which they have like twice a year. Well, let's get back to your thing with the Eva game. If you look at that story carefully, and if you want to, we will. Uh, yeah, we probably should. Well, you just, you know, you would. Hang on, hang on. I, don't, I want to finish this up. Because, uh, in terms of literal truth, levels of truth, all I said in print was uh, that there were rumors in Milwaukee of a that the candidate was uh, eating a strange drug called Ibogaine, and the reason that came to my mind was that I was just reading the press release from uh, Farm Camp Labs, and it happened to be on Ibogaine that week, and they had the uh, you know the symptoms. And I just occurred to me that shit, uh, that's a, just like Ed Muskie to me. Cheers up for no reason. Yeah, I'm just looking for it here. Here we go. But I think in, in a lot of cases, I, this may be technical, uh, exoneration, but I think in almost every case, I, I, uh, it, I, there's a tip off that this is a, a, a fantasy. Uh, What's yeah. the, how do you tip it off? It's a fantasy. Well, let's see. The AP played it as if it was straight. 
Yeah, you know, that's what happened. The AP picked it up. I suppose drugs or something like that. It's like, you know, relentlessly awful. Maybe we shouldn't have all been so very good. Yeah. Like, well, the people, uh, here he, here he is, yeah. Well, let's see. Yeah, it knocked him out of the race. No, you did. Yeah. With this idol game. Yeah. Uh, like, there's the next time, like, in the, in the you know, writer said this to me, he said, so, Terry, you realize what happened? I said, well, said, well, Hunter just, like, you know, put a presidential contender, like, out of the race. Um, yeah, the front runner. Did you vote for Hunter? So I suppose oh, it uh, suggests the power of the journalist. <laughs> and it was a made-up item? No, 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 not at all. And that's why I'm, I'm trying to find I have. I'm serious. I'm just trying to figure where to start. There are problems with this story, George. Well, uh, not if you look at it carefully. <laughs> well, we do see if we see what we're doing now. All right, let's see. Uh, this is an italics break from the previous uh, scene. I'd like to see how you introduce this notion. Okay. I'm, I'm going on faith here. Uh, the most common known source of Abigail, this is a, in a clear shift from the right. previous... Uh, Huge from him weeping on the podium. Right. Well, he's played everything, yeah. The most common known source of Abigail is from the roots of the Tabernethi Iboga, a shrub indigenous to West Africa. See, this came straight out of the farm chem, uh, it says. Laboratory spell of California. Indigenous West Africa. As early as what? As early as 1869, roots of TI, that's the uh, game, were reported effective in. Is this, is this what? Rolling Stone? What you're reading now? Yeah. Yeah. And this is what uh, EAP picks up. Oh, and suddenly I was. Uh, with, with, famous for exposing the, the uh, Freak Seven. All right, as early as 1869, roots of TI were reported effective in combating sleep or fatigue and in maintaining alertness when ingested by African natives. Extracts of TI are used by natives while stalking game. game. It enables them to remain motionless for as long as two days while retaining mental alertness. It has been used for centuries by natives of Africa, Asia, and South America in conjunction with fetishistic and mythical ceremonies. In 1905, the gross effects of chewing large amount, large quantities of TI roots were described. Quote, soon his nerves get tense in an extraordinary way. An epileptic-like madness comes over him, during which he becomes unconscious and pronounces words which are interpreted by the older members of the group as having a prophetic meaning and to prove that the fetish has entered him. Uh, all right, I'll, I should go on here. This, it, the more you get every plant. At the turn of the century, the above that. Is, the hunter chooses to uh, suggest that the only way that the man can remain, you know, to be on the day, to be chewing out of the day, I understand that, but why did you, uh, why did you, unless you had, did not really like the man from Maine, why did you pick this piece to stick just where it is? Because it turned up in my mail on that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's a terrifying thing to do. Have you ever had sort of vague regrets about that? No. No. Yeah, why not? <laughs> I had some about Humphrey, but uh, not about uh, Musky. Musky. Right here. Now, so it goes on twice as long there. And... Uh, you recall, of course, um, uh, Musky denying Look, I didn't do any good. No, I mean, I mean it's like it's so, so so raucously berserk that the a, the guy who was like a senior senator from Maine goes on TV and denies that he's like addicted to a drug that no one has ever heard of. Ibogaine. <laughs> he I, he feels that it's important enough to say no. Ibogaine. Well, they were so crazy after Ibogaine losing Florida. In the hunter, I remember I was with him, kind of, I was thinking about it, it's like it's a time thing, just like, you know, I mean, Well, here it, it is. It would surely be the most powerful. It would completely change the campaign. Have you ever had a, have you ever struck a blow as, as blow as that? Is that? What about <laughs> God? Destroying this man, destroying his reputation. I've never claimed the uh, credit for it. <laughs> well, well, hunter was the person. Hunter wanted, hunter wanted, hunter wanted, hunter wanted, hunter wanted Gary Gary to the White House. No, but then it was McGovern, and I figured, uh. Excuse me, McGovern. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't think. Actually, I did too. Political but journalism. I, I've it's never. What's your language? I don't know. Is it rumored? Say, yeah. All right. Let's hear this though. All right. After the report comes off, describing all this, all the symptoms, the richness of the psychological experience, many are disturbed by lights or noises. Dr. Claudio Naranjo says it's. I've been more impressed by the injury effects resulting from ibogaine than by those from sessions conducted with any other drug. Woo. Okay, but, all right, paragraph to uh, sentence back to uh, Roman. It is rumored. Not much has been written about the Ibogaine effect as a serious factor in the presidential campaign. Why, though? But toward the end of the Wisconsin primary I race... I got the man from Maine. Oh, hang on. But toward the end of the Wisconsin primary race, about a week before the vote, word leaked out that some of Muskie's top advisors had called in a Brazilian doctor who was said to be treating the candidate with, quote, some kind of strange drug that nobody in the press corps had ever heard of. Word leaked out. And That's made up by you, right? I heard it. That's what we're talking about, the levels of truth here. Okay, all right, there's a paragraph. It had been common knowledge for many weeks that Humphrey was using an exotic brand of speed known as Wallet, W-A-L-L-O-T. And it had long been whispered that Muskie was into something very heavy. But it was hard to take the talk seriously until I heard about the appearance of a mysterious Brazilian doctor. That was the key. I immediately recognized the Ibogaine effect. You totally correct me. Well, I'm just reading it. From Muskie's cheerful breakdown on a flatbed truck in New Hampshire. That's how you did it. Yeah. The delusions and altered thinking that characterized his campaign in Florida and finally a condition of total rage, quote, that gripped him in Wisconsin. There was no doubt about it. The man from Maine had turned to massive doses of Ibogaine as a last resort. It was about to break down in New Hampshire. The only the remaining... Possible word that suggests that is... Well, hang on, hang on. Massive. <laughs> yeah, that's your only lot out is massive. Well, hang on. It's going, it's going. The only remaining question was, quote, when did he start? Question mark. <laughs> But nobody can answer this one, and I was not able to press the candidate himself for an answer because I was permanently barred from the monkey campaign after that incident on the Sunshine Special in Florida. I remember that. Remember the boho yeah. on the Sunshine Special? And that, and that scene makes far more sense now than it did at the time. I had sworn, you know, vengeance on the bastards for barring me from the uh, campaign. And wow, quite a blow you struck. <laughs> yeah. Well, you made up a. All right. Muskie has always taken pride in his ability to deal with hecklers. He has frequently challenged them, calling them, calling them up to the stage in front of big crowds and then forcing the poor bastard to debate with him in the blaze of TV lights. Oh, God. But there was none of that in Florida. When the boohoo began grabbing at his legs and screaming for more gin, Big went all to pieces. Big Ed went all to pieces. Which gave rise to speculation, uh among reporters familiar with his campaign style in 68 and 70, that Muskie was not himself. And boy, we can take this one in court. Uh, it was noted, among other, thing, among other things, that he had developed a tendency to roll his eyes wildly during TV interviews, <laughs> that his thought patterns had become strangely fragmented, and that not even his closest advisors could predict when he might suddenly spiral off into babbling rages or neo-comatose funks. And it's, it is quite logical. In retrospect, however, it is e easy to see why Muskie fell apart on the news platform. Alright, alright. Uh, now we get into a little, little more details. And this is all true as far as I know. We can only speculate on, speculate on this. He pointed pieces of Florida. Only speculate on this. Because those in a position to know have flatly refused to comment on rumors concerning the senator's disastrous experiments with Ibogaine. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I tried to find the Brazilian. I tried to find the Brazilian doctor on election night in Milwaukee, but by the time the polls closed, he was long gone. Oh. One of the hired bimbos in Milwaukee's Holiday Inn headquarters said a man with fresh welts on his head had been dragged out the side door and put on a bus to Chicago. But we were never we were never able to confirm this. 
that sort of moves from into a wonderful lunacy. Well, God, you just go in. from truth to you go from the, those levels. Go, honey. <laughs> the uh, fear and loathing is one of the great titles. Did that uh, come to you suddenly, or did someone suggest it? What's the history of fear and loathing? I read into it last night in a 1969 letter. It's a, it's a good phrase for one. I, I'd never seen it before or heard it. People have accused me from stealing it from what, Kierkegaard or something? Shit, I don't think he was ever that good to come up with a phrase like that in that way. Sendo. Sendo? No, I didn't hear it from anybody. It just seemed like the right phrase. First time I, I intentionally used it was Vegas for a title, Fear and Loathing. And once you get that kind of title down, on, once you see it on paper, there's no way you're going to change it. Unless you're a complete asshole. So the yeah. American dream was, was to be called that until you, you change the whole um, structure of the original? I think the, the Vegas book was just really a desperate attempt to get off the hook for that American dream at death of in fact, everything I came across was part of the same story. Do you remember when you changed the death of the American dream into the half novel? Do you remember the, when you did it? it was a, actually, you write Silverman a little bit about it. It's quite remarkable when you do decide that. It's an epiphany, isn't it? Yeah, but not one that I, anybody or I arranged or anything like that. Uh, I think you write it, doesn't he? Listen, I've just, just figured out how to do it. Is that more or yeah. less what you're saying? Yeah, it's like, uh, I know how to do it. It's almost an exclamation. Well, what it... You're trying from 68, covering Democratic Convention, all these things, trying to look for the American dream, and suddenly that idea of taking, mixing our old dude with that, you know, Vegas story came, and we both came together. Yeah, it was a moment of epiphany, but I can't remember what it was. We should start with Raoul Duke, because maybe when we do this interview, how did the older ego come about, and why, and when? Oh, but I keep coming across it in the letters. You know, disgust, dissected. Yeah, I discussed it in letters to Silverman in, in 69. If yeah, maybe that would be the right thing. I know this, and I was cutting him last night. I was in the book with the Dr. Chuck. It might be useful for you to describe yourself with Well, he looks a little bit yeah, like uh, Lieberman. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. Not the strip for sure. You know, small, thin, uh, quiet, quite an odd, a brutally thieving person. <laughs> yeah, seriously, according to Ian, uh, Silverman is the guy who really got off of those 17,000 books. That's what I thought. Well, I'm glad you said that. Because, uh, also, Ian Valentine. Yeah, but these were hardcover books. He was the answer that was, that was moving slowly forward the death of the American dream. The correspondence is wonderful about that. We only talked about that, but what... So he was your editor at Random House, and and you get writing about how this book was having a difficulty. You couldn't seem to move it, and all of a sudden there's this letter talking about Las Vegas. And did you talk about the genesis of, of how it became from one to the other? Raul Duke, you so wrote him on that. Well, first of all, describe, I started you? using him uh, originally for as a. Uh, I what I wrote for Scanlon's, and I would review uh, weapons, police weapons, just like I would do drugs. You and you yourself, you'd use this older ego. Yeah, do, yeah. yeah. When I, you know, I was Hunter Thompson, I was the chief magistrate of Woody Creek, as far as they were concerned. That's where a lot of my equipment and my uh, invitations and information came from. You know, the latest gas on the market. Uh, What's the name derived from, Raul Duke? Yes, Raul comes from uh, Castro's brother. 
Uh, I, don't know. I, mean, I don't know when I started using it before, yeah. Probably on something like false registration at a hotel or... That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It all comes from criminal instinct somehow. <laughs>